Hello everybody, thanks for being here. Uh, I will briefly introduce myself. My name is Alberto Maldegan. I live in uh, Luxoft in the uh, automotive field since a few months. Before that I was working at uh, Canonical uh, most of the time on the uh, Ubuntu phone efforts. And then previously I was working at Nokia and of course it was still phones especially with uh, on the MIMO platform, which is Linux-based. And today I want to talk to you about uh, Speculum, which is a um, uh, spare time project of mine that I started a few years ago. Uh, but it was actually uh, caused by some, uh, by some needs that I found, I think I found at work, especially during my years at Nokia because in this uh, Linux based phone we are using, uh, we are making a lot of use of DBus. I don't know if you are familiar with it. It's a, it's a system for inter process communication and it is uh, a bit peculiar because every, every message that is changed between two processes actually passes through a third process, that is the message broker that then deliver, delivers this message to the intended uh, recipients. And we found out um, that this was a bit of a bottleneck in our architecture. We were, we were using, uh, well, I was part of the instant messaging and voice calls communi uh, communication team and we were using a framework called Telepathy, which was, was making very heavy use of uh, DBus. It was like a lot of process. Every, um, every uh, messaging provider was running its own process. Then there were the user interface was, was its own process. The logger was its own process. So you can imagine that, especially during the boot or a, early phases after the boot when the phone was still doing other things uh, it was actually kind of a, of a bottleneck a bit because we were using it improperly in my opinion like doing too much things on this uh, D-Bus but also because of its uh, own uh, nature that every message had to pass through uh, the central broker uh, I spent some time thinking about uh, a solution and uh, it was 2011, in my blog I wrote a post about uh, DBus, which, um, which was just an idea of how I would, uh, if I had to start from uh, a fresh, uh, it was like describing what I would have done. Uh, but of course, that was 2011 and a uh, few months after writing this blog post, we had this uh, change of strategy that Nokia uh, kind of migrated to the micro Microsoft platform, so uh, I left the company, and then um, yeah, it kind of st stayed there. Um, still, this idea kept a bit um, running through my mind, and uh, I decided to try to spend some of my own time to uh, to start this project with a much smaller scope and that was writing just a library for shared memory management. Uh, I guess most of you know what is shared memory. Basically it is when the RAM, when a part of RAM of your PC is actually shared between different processes. Typically you have one writer and many readers uh, but uh, there are many other possible uses for this. So, uh, what is Speculum? Uh, well, the word in Interlingua, which is a nice language that I invite everybody to learn, uh, means uh, mirror. And yeah, it's just because shared memory uh, reminded me of a mirror. It's a very, uh, very small library about uh, 2,000 lines of calls, and actually most of them are comments. 
Uh, and it is, uh, I would say, another thin wrapper on top of uh, is, is a, uh, SHM Open and MMAP. It is lockless. That's, uh, I think, one important thing. So it is meant to have only one writer and many readers. And I will show you how it is possible to achieve this without having any locks at all. It is uh, zero copy in the sense that the writer could, uh, for instance, uh, pass uh, the address of the shared memory to a system function that uh, reads a file, for example. So the data will be written from the file inside the uh, shared memory area without uh, being copied. And Everything is uh, written just using uh, O6 APIs. Uh, there are a couple of... Um... Okay, no, I will not mention that. But it, it's portable, really. Which level of politics? Sorry? Which level of politics? I didn't... I don't know, honestly. Um, so, what are the design principles? Um, well, in order to achieve this lockless uh, goal, uh, I had to decide to make it um, that every part, every part of the shared memory, most of it at least, there are a few control bytes here and there that can actually change, but most of the uh, data that you write to the shared memory never changes. And uh, yeah, of course, the readers. Uh, Need, the, need to open the shared memory area only in read-only mode. So there is no risk that it will uh, mess up with the actual data. Uh, I'm soon going to show you how it works. Uh, there is one useful concept that uh, you must be aware of, and that is of uh, memory barriers. Uh, memory barriers are a way to guarantee that uh, the data that once you write a certain uh, flag all the data that you have written before writing this flag is also visible to other processes you can think of it as a um, commit in a databases or sync flash for the file system it just applies to RAM and this is actually the thing that I mentioned before when I was talking about POSIX. It's uh, these memory barriers, they are uh, compiler specific. So in the header file, I need to have different macros to, for them, and I have implemented them only for uh, GCC and CLAN. So if someone wants to compile this library with other compilers, this probably is something that needs to be addressed. Okay. And now I'm going to show you how, uh, how actually this uh, works, how the data is being written to the uh, shared memory in a way that every reader gets a consistent view of the data um, and, uh, yeah, and how it is possible to achieve this without locks. Uh, I'm only going to show you the writer side just for uh, space limitation on the slide, uh, but you should try at every step to imagine what would happen if a reader would suddenly try to open this memory area and start reading it. Okay, it's actually visible. Okay, nice. So, um, it all starts with a, a function call that is specular area new. It takes the name of the area, it can be any arbitrary string. Well, I think it must be a valid file name, but yeah. And uh, flags, just to say if the area must be existing or if we are creating a new one. And uh, this doesn't allocate anything on the uh, shell memory. It just allocates a structure on the heap and it initializes it with, uh, with a bit of data that is needed to control it. After that, the writer can call other functions to, perhaps say, to customize uh, the behavior of the, of the library, like how big this uh, 
memory area must be. There are other settings about how to, we will see it later, how to compact the, uh, the memory, like what is the percentage of all the data that is acceptable to have in the area before it gets uh, recompacted and other things and finally it's called specular create a specular area create and uh, and this one actually creates uh, an object a file uh, in the uh, shared memory and just in it uh, sets a flex there that says that the state of this memory area is initializing, it's not ready. So if a reader started to look at this file, it would know that I don't have to touch it yet. Still, this function con continues to do other stuff, so it continues to uh, write a few, a few data that are needed for, uh, for Speculo to operate the size of the memory area and ID. And then the, this chunk ID, uh, if you can read it, it's, the, uh, it's a counter for the uh, ID of the various chunk, chunks, blocks that will be uh, allocated later. And the last one is, so from after this, uh, the, the chunk ID, it starts to be um, the space for uh, the memory chunks that will be allocated. So we start with setting a flag that says that the first chunk is, un un is un unallocated, not allocated, uh, which means that any reader would see that there is nothing in the memory area. And uh, yeah, after doing this, the flag of the memory area is changed to ready. So, and, and these flags are always changed with the memory barriers, which means that when I change this one to ready, any reader would also see the size, the ID, and all the other data that have been written so far. And at this point, also uh, a manifest file, like a real file of the file system gets created. It tells the reader uh, where, how to find this memory area. I will not give you the detail how actually this file is only one byte long at the moment, at least in the current implementation. Uh, and this file always gets updated atomically. I will soon you will see why this needs to be updated. Okay, as I said, if a reader would start to read uh, the memory area at this point, would we'll see that there is nothing. So let's try to uh, write something there. The function to write is a specular area create chunk. Again, this doesn't do really anything. The chunk parameter is a structure that you have allocated on the stack. It just initializes it. The function to allocate it is specular chunk allocate, and it just takes takes the size, uh, that is the amount of data that you intend to write in the shared memory for, for this block. When I say chunk, it means block. I don't know if it's uh, proper English, but that's it. And it, it, it returns a pointer. Uh, you see on the memory area that we have created, a, we have written a chunk ID. It's like the last ID that was taken from the memory area and the one in the memory area gets uh, incremented by one so that the uh, next chunk will take a uh, different ID. Uh, here uh, there are also other uh, APIs that can be called on the chunk structure to uh, change the expiration timestamp and uh, a few other things, we will see them later. Um, but after we have uh, decided how big it will be, at the end of our uh, memory block, we write again one state flag. Uh, again, it's uh, not allocated. And our uh, the state for our chunk is uh, changed to allocated. Okay, so what happens if a reader tries to read this one? It says that, okay, the memory area is ready, the first chunk is there, but it's still in allocated phase. It's not uh, meant to be read yet. And it can continue 
to read the uh, next uh, chunk, it says it's uh, not located, okay, nothing to read for me. Now, how to write to the memory area? Well, we have a pointer, so we can just use uh, any function that we want. Here we use a uh, string copy to write something there. And then we have to commit. This is very important. Uh, the commit operation is very simple, it's just toggling of uh, the state flag and uh, it becomes written, which means that at this point it's actually uh, meaningful for uh, any readers. We can write one more uh, chunk, I will not go through all the steps, but they are exactly the same. So, first thing, you set the ch chunk state to, uh, well it was already not allocated, but uh, you create a new one at the end of the memory area that says unallocated, you start filling it, you write uh, the data, when commit is changed, finally the, uh, the flag is uh, changed to uh, return. So, what happens when you end, when you end up uh, exhausting the memory area, like there is no space to write anything? Uh, that's the interesting part. Because, of course, I say that we are not going to modify this memory area, so we need to create a new copy. Uh, what happens is that Specula will create a new uh, shared memory area, the same size, uh, it will not increase it. Uh, I mean, this is something that can be changed with flags, but uh, typically it should not be increased. And then all the valid chunks are going to be copied over. Uh, why do I say invalid? Because they are also invalid. Uh, so invalid data are those that are expired. I mentioned briefly before. Expired means that if you write a chunk and say that this is valid only for a couple of seconds, for the next two seconds, well, of course, uh, when we uh, finish the space in the memory area and we look through all the chunks, we check their timestamps, and if they are too old, then we will not copy them. And then there are also obsolete chunks that we will explain uh, in the well in very few slides. And uh, once we have created our copy of the memory area only with the valid uh, chunks, we update atomically the manifest files so that new readers will uh, will immediately start reading the the new stuff. So what happens to the old readers, those who have already this opened? Well, we set the state of the area to obsolete it, and every function in the reader of a uh, speculo always checks the state before uh, actually reading the memory area. So if it sees that it is obsolete, it will not continue reading it, it will uh, close this memory area and it will uh, open the new one by rereading the manifest file and figuring out where it is. And finally, the old memory area, this one, uh, gets uh, unlinked. Unlinked uh, like it's really the unlink operation of the uh, of POSIX. So, this file basically disappears from the uh, shared memory uh, subtree. However, uh, as you know, like in uh, Unix, if you are reading a file and you delete it, you can still continue reading it. If you have it open, then it's fine. So uh, you have met this uh, a memory in your, uh, in your process, so you can continue reading it. When the last reader will close it, then uh, of course the operating system will get rid of this one. Okay, I mentioned obsolete data, so as I said, it's chunks which have expired, but also we, it's uh, chunks which have been updated. So we have an update operation which takes the, uh, this uh, structure of a chunk and the new size, and basically it's uh, just um, a new allocation, it creates a completely new chunk, it just retains the chunk ID, and the reader, the readers, will know that uh, 
that this is, uh, how to say, a new version of the chunk of the data. You can think of it, um, for instance, if you have, uh, if you are using Specula for configuration, like, think for, for example, uh, you are storing a JSON file in shared memory, okay? When you change a flag in the JSON file, then you would call this uh, method here. You would create, you, you would call update with the new size, you write the new JSON there, and uh, the reader will know that I have to forget about the previous one. Uh, okay. So, how can Specular be used? Uh, at least the way that I envision it, that I see it, is that it can be used as a stream of messages. So, you have a writer that continuously well, when it needs to, it writes uh, memory, uh, writes uh, messages in the memory area. It can be short, it can be long, it can be big messages, doesn't matter. But it sets an expiration time on each of them. Uh, of course, like it's, it really depends on the uh, on the needs. But uh, if you think of, uh, if I, I'm always thinking of the use case that we had in Nokia, so it was like instant messaging and. Uh, uh, like uh, notifications about our incoming call and stuff like uh, expiration time would be a couple of seconds because we know that in a couple of seconds all other processes should have been able to to read this uh, memory it was not like big uh, big messages and uh, you can have like a network of processes talking to each other but still you must make sure to I mean it's a limitation of specular, of course. It's uh, everyone who has something to say needs to be a writer. So every process that is going to uh, send outcoming messages need to open specular as a writer. Or another use case is publishing a data block. It's uh, the case that I mentioned before with the JSON file, for example. Uh, okay, that is uh, all about what I wanted to say. You can find the code, documentation, you can email me. Uh, my blog, I, I'm writing about everything, so not only uh, technology, and I'm writing in English, interlingua Italian, so it might not be that interesting. I have another uh, blog in uh, Russian only. I'm studying Russian, so it's uh, for my mistakes. And I'm also on Twitter, there I have to warn you, it's mostly political content, so it's a lot of propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to say a couple of words before taking questions, since we have time, uh, because there is, uh, it's kind of unrelated, unrelated, but it was a consideration that I wanted to make, that uh, it looks to me like software is evolving in a strange way because software tends to be to grow, like to uh, gain new features and then at some point there are kind of, uh, how to say, drops. Like uh, software can get uh, rewritten from scratch and sometimes it gets rewritten even with a completely different spirit or like new projects uh, take over the old ones. And I have in mind the case of uh, Wayland, for example, and System D. And one thing that strikes me is that if you look at these technologies, there is nothing really that couldn't have been done 30 or 40 years ago. Okay, System D uses C groups and they make use of the new stuff, sure. But like the spirit, I remember that I read the um, blog post from uh, Leonard Pottering about uh, like when he was actually introducing System D, and it was kind of striking that there were new ideas, but using the old concept. It was uh, very interesting and refreshing, and I I don't want to uh, say that this um, applies to specula as well, uh, because actually I don't know anyone using it yet because I haven't doing I haven't pursue it uh, myself because of lack of free time and interest in more projects, but uh, um, it's interesting to see how software can, uh, can grow 
while becoming much simpler. If you look at Wayland, for example, Wayland and X11, like X11, it's extremely complex. It's uh, for uh, remote machines that can do really everything, and they have Wayland, which is much simpler, but it is exactly what we need. <laughs> okay, and that's uh, over with the philosophy, and if you have questions, you're already welcome to ask. Please. Yeah. Do you plan to wrap this in a more high-level framework, like the debus-ish, or is this going to be just a toolkit for wrapping your own IPC? That was the idea. That was the idea, and if I will have time, uh, I will do that. But I realize that it is a very, very uh, uh, demanding uh, project. Uh, debus, yeah. Because I cannot just do uh, a better device. It needs to be compatible at the API level, otherwise no one will use it. And uh, this, this is a bit uh, tricky. Yeah. One thing that I can say, now, uh, one nice thing I can say about Specular is that it doesn't use any file descriptor. So, okay, you, of course you need a file descriptor when you open the shared memory, but then once it's mapped into your process, you can actually close it. So. You don't have to worry about proliferation of uh, file descriptors. You know there there might be limits on the machine, especially if it's uh, embedded devices. Uh, so you can. Speculo doesn't have any signaling of itself. It doesn't tell you when there is data to be written. So you need to use I don't know if you want to use Linux signals or uh, Unix sockets, but you can do that because. Uh, you have file descriptors available. Uh, Specular is not uh, occupying that. Uh, have you tried to benchmark it performance wise? Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I did, uh, not very seriously to be honest. I, one thing I noticed is that setting up shell memory is very expensive. So I was imagining that it will go like that and immediately, uh, but uh, creating the memory area and when you start writing to it, I think it's, uh, it seems that there is uh, the biggest cost in there. And that's why it's nice that uh, you can write different type of blocks inside the same memory area, uh, same memory area file. So no, I didn't try to, uh, there, there are unit tests and they print timing information. I didn't find a way to reliably test the speed in a way that would be fair to compare because the technology is very different from Unix sockets. If I compare like with Unix sockets, how many processes do I have to uh, put? I know that if I put like uh, 100 processes talking together with Unix sockets, Specular will of course win. But then if there are only two, I, I tried with two, so two processes talking by sockets, it seems it's uh, the fastest thing ever. So sockets are extremely efficient. But when you have more parties talking to each other, it depends how big are the blocks, how frequent they are, so it's, uh, it's very tricky to measure. I think I would need to know what is the use case, and then we can try to, to measure that way. Yes. Um, would it be correct to say that this library is sort of set up for two parties that are both interested in making it work? Uh, I, what I'm, I'd like to speak about security, so the, the opposite of that would be that the, the two programs don't trust each other fully. Have you considered that? And I'm, I mean to fill, follow up with a question about sealing of, do you know the sealing feature of, of shared memory in the Linux kernel? Uh, no, I think I don't know that feature. Uh, so, yes, I've considered this and uh, I think it is secure in the way, in the sense that uh, if the file can be protected, if you can rely on the fact that uh, only the writer can write that yeah. file. That right. That yeah. No, the problem is rather if, if you have a a writer uh, who's trying to trick the reader somehow. 
Um, the ceiling feature essentially makes the shared memory uh, read only once it has once it has been committed. So the reader can know that it cannot be changed during the time that it has read, read part of it uh, towards the time it, it is reading the end of it, essentially. Or if it does, if the protocol or the implementation in the reader is such that it will go back to the buffer multiple times, it wants to know that the data has not been changed in between. And so, I, in this case, would it be possible for me as a writer to um, basically open the shared memory and bypass your library? So could I open it and get a file descriptor and then write things to it without following the protocol that, that your library is actually yeah, enforcing? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that you won't be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing something with the shared, le uh, shared memory, so I'm setting some flags that it's meant to be read uh, sequentially, like, but that's just for optimization. Right. Yeah. It might be that this can be changed to actually take into account your suggestion. So if we set the size, if we, when uh, the writer allocates the size, maybe we increase it to say that it is at least one page, for example. I guess that the feature that you mentioned works for every single page, right? Um. I, I don't know that, but I, I, if you're talking about the ceiling feature, I know that you can you can basically say that this is now um, read only, and the kernel will enforce that. So the reader knows that from this point forward, uh, the writer cannot um, change the data that they originally committed. Um, the, the kind of attack would be that you're you're fooling the reader to think that it's it's one thing, and then the reader goes into a certain part of the program and later on you, you switch some data around uh, making the, the reader implementation uh, malfunction. So I thank you for your answer. I think it's still a, a very useful library. Um, but if you were to implement something like DBus, then this uh, the, the, the aspect of the two parties not fully trusting each other would, would have to be uh, addressed somehow. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I guess we are out of time. Yeah, any more questions? Otherwise, thank you very much.